to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario, where in the midst of the self-isolating and being at home all the time, I, uh, as I do normally, but I've, even more so now, I've been entertaining myself by listening to Broadway soundtracks. Uh, everyone who I work with our Parks Canada, I think, knows by now if I have headphones in, I'm listening to Broadway something. I just, I find them a nice, they're usually about an hour long for a soundtrack, and it has a nice narrative to it, different styles of songs. Uh, so that's what I like to listen to, and it, it made me think about the biggest show of the 21st century, and, and arguably one of the biggest shows ever, Hamilton. And I've had this debate in my head about the overall quality of, of Hamilton relative at least to its reputation and I wanted to talk to people who are uh, who who've also seen the show who like the show who are invested in the show so I'm very excited to welcome in to the History Slam today Tara Brookfield associate professor at Laurier University who's been on the show before I don't know if you remember this Tara back in 2015 uh, to talk about Grindstone Island so welcome back thank you and uh, also excited to be joined by Chris Tyndall, who is a uh, history, self-described history fan uh, who wrote the blog Acres of Snow, uh, lived in New York, got to see Hamilton on Broadway with part of the, uh, part of the original Broadway cast, uh, now lives out in San Francisco, ran for federal office uh, twice for the Green Party here in Canada, ran municipally once as well, so both you know, an expert or at least familiar with American life and Canadian political life and, and a history fan as well. So, Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sean. So uh, I'm very excited to get into this uh, and, and talk about Hamilton. So let's I just want to start, though. When I saw the show, I saw it on Broadway about a year and a half ago and I came out of the show uh, and I, I saw it with people who were super excited like to see it and knew all the words and I came out of the show, and my first reaction was, that was good. Like, and, and apparently in the world of Hamilton fans, if you say the show is good, it's the equivalent of saying it's the worst thing ever. Uh, that, that's sort of the <laughs> reaction I got. So, you know, th there are certain elements of it that I really like. The choreography, I think, is great. Uh, I have some structural issues with it. But, but Tara, let's start with you. How do you describe the show to people when, when people are asking you or, or if you're just talking about the show? What is your description for folks? I think I fail at a description because when I start by saying it's about the like a U.S. Treasury Secretary, yeah. people's eyes already glaze over at that point. <laughs> and, and then I flounder and I say, well, you know, it's not traditional Broadway music. It has a lot of hip hop elements and it's really energetic. And then I say, but it also has some traditional Broadway elements. And by then I've lost the people. If they haven't heard of it by now, um, I don't think it's necessarily their thing, but I think if I was like to really press hard, I think it's, it's, it's a compelling story about hubris and um, both in terms of just sort of the general American spirit, but also like in the character of Hamilton and it's sort of how that hubris sort of grows and expands and ultimately sort of takes his life. So it's in some ways an optimistic tragedy. Hmm. Uh, what about you, Chris? Sean, you only thought it was good? Who, yeah. Who hurt you? What? what? <laughs> I, would, I would have had a similar reaction to your friends. I got my got my back up there. Uh, I, I also, it's interesting if you describe it as, um, uh, you know, a, a rap musical, I think you get into trouble because that's not really the point. <laughs> and people start imagining something uh I mean, it is a rap musical, but like it's it's hard to, or you could describe it as a as as Tara said, like a musical about a treasury secretary. And whatever whatever uh, description you give it, people start to picture one narrow thing within that band. One of the one of the appeals to me about the musical is that I think it I think it is many different things to different people. You could describe it as a love story. You know, you can describe it as a musical about history. You can describe it as a musical about. Um, just about various human stories of of conflict and um, and love and forgiveness and redemption. So uh, I also struggle to describe it. I usually just tell people that they need to go see it. 
<laughs> yeah, and, and I think the thing about yeah, it's a rap musical. That is, it's not a fair description because there's so many songs that aren't that in the show, right? Like mm -hmm. I think my favorite song, I think from what I've read online, a lot of people's favorite song is "Wait for It," and I don't think it'd be fair to describe that as a, a rap song necessarily uh and burn too like that's pretty like pretty yeah. traditional show tune -y. um certainly there's a lot of rap in the show and and the uh the uh, cabinet battles are you know prominent features but yeah like it, it's a lot more diverse in its musical styling than i think a lot of people initially give it credit for because it was branded so much as a rap musical yeah, one of my initial impressions after I listened through to the uh, to the cast recording a few times, which was my first exposure to it, I listened to like a lot of people listened to the cast recording uh, many many times before I got to see the actual uh, production. And my first impression was, oh, that was actually a better musical than it was a rap musical. It was a better, and the the musical was better than the rap, if that makes sense. Because mm -hmm. um, I think that sometimes people. I'm not, and this is not to slag on the, on the rap. Like I enjoy the rhymes and they're fun, uh, but I don't think anyone is arguing that it's the greatest rap of all time, or the greatest rap writing or or uh, or rap songs of all time. It works as a musical, I think. On a, it works better as a musical than if you were trying to compare it to great rap music. Yeah, I remember I saw, I saw a show off Broadway. I can't remember what it was called, but it was the story of Othello that was done as a rap musical. It was just a, basically just a straight shot all the way through. And I thought, yeah, that's a rap musical. And then I saw Hamilton. I was like, that's, this is so far off of what, uh, of what that is. And I, I think, I don't know, Tara, what do you think? Because when I listen to the soundtrack, I, I'm struck by how little rap, I think there, I think there's influence of, of, of hip hop in a lot of the show, but for a lot of the Skyler sister songs, uh, for the Aaron Burr character, he, he participates in the rap stuff. But a, a lot of it is, I mean, Hamilton, I think, is one of the only characters who raps throughout the whole thing. I think that what makes the cast recording so listenable, because there's so many different genres of music being represented. Act one and act two are so different in terms of structure, and I'm curious to know um, Chris's, Chris's um, maybe critique of, the, of it as a structure. But I think you can listen to it and you can hear sort of like 1960s ballads. You can go and hear something more traditional like a Rodgers and Hammerstein or or even something like Sondheim. And But then you can get into some more um, modern music as well. And I think I have different moods. I'll put on different songs. Sometimes I'll listen to it straight through. And I think the diversity of both the score and the voices and the dialogue and slow songs and fast and unbelievably fast it just it just makes it you never get bored listening to it you can always put on a section or a song and get something out of it yeah you're absolutely right because yeah, you can go from like david diggs who, and i have no how i have no idea how he did that every night um in <laughs> what the song where he's uh where he comes back uh at the, the top what of that too what did i miss yeah um like that it's incredible um what what he can do uh so in looking at it as as that musical side of it, I, I'm curious to know to how much, because it is a musical, like how much leeway should we as historians and people interested in history give the show in terms of its storytelling? Uh, Lin Manuel Miranda was very clear that you know there are certain liberties that are taken with the the factual reality of what Alexander Hamilton's life was and. You know, how much when we're looking at it, do we have to take that into account that, you know, from the musical genres to the storytelling techniques in terms of just as a our understanding of it as a musical, it's presented as history. But we know that there are liberties taken within it. Does that influence our the, or the way we relate to the, the music and the, the story that's being told? Tara, what do you think? Well, personally, I think. I grew up liking history because I liked the stories and whether it was in a film or a novel where there was just maybe just a kernel of truth and then a story built around it. I feel like that's how I got attached to wanting to know more and doing like nonfiction research and more academic research. And so I love it as a story 
and being able to, you know, I mean, in this one, it's not just even a kernel, because I think you can learn a little bit about the Revolutionary War, you can learn a bit about gender relations, you can learn about certainly Hamilton's biography, and take little bits away that you didn't know. And I think in my teaching, I try to start with, I use a lot of stories as sort of the starting point for getting into sort of broader academic themes and evidence and things like that. So I think it is a great kernel to get conversations started. And certainly there's a lot of creative license taken, both in terms of the the story being told and the way it's being told. But I think it's, it just, it can inspire a lot of interest that might just remain just that, or it can inspire people to do more reading and learn about the debates about his representation, for example. So I think it is a great starting point and it's exciting. It's not, it's not static. So I think it can appeal to a wide range of people, whether they're traditional Broadway fans or, or young people who aren't necessarily in the theater, but like the style of music or like the performer. So I think he can do a lot despite um, maybe what some professional historians or, or more, um, long-term sort of experts on the subject matter might have nitpicky or bigger things to say about some of the, the themes and topics and how they're presented. Yeah, I, th I think the reaction of young people is one of the most interesting things to this, right? Like if you, when you go to a Broadway show or, or if you go, if there's a musical locally that you go see, you know, I'm 34 and I am by far one of the youngest people in the room most of the time, uh, depending on the show, but it, it's, Musicals tend to not attract young people, but this one, young people just flock to it and flock to the music of it. But then, Chris, one of my concerns then as a history or as a historian is that because, as Tara mentioned, there is historical license taken uh, in terms of the storytelling. Is this the, the best initiation for young people into history? Well, I agree with with Tara's description of it as a kernel. I think that historical fiction is a great gateway drug to real history and that the Hamilton musical, I think we've seen, you can almost quantify that in the sales of the Ron Chernow biography of Hamilton. Uh, more people read that book because of the musical than uh, would have otherwise. And for me personally, I mean, maybe I'm over indexing a bit on my own experience, but the musical Hamilton was, it is, it is the reason that I read then went and read the Ron Chernow book. But then it's also the reason that I started writing my history blog that you mentioned and started researching more history myself in order to learn more of more of the actual history. So for me, I, because of the musical, uh, I did learn more history than I would have otherwise. But I do think to, to go back to your your one question earlier, I, I do think we still should criticize it and be aware of the ways in which it takes liberties. Um, even as someone who only slightly jokingly gets offended when, when, when someone says, oh, it's only good. Uh, that's that's <laughs> on, the level of, on the level of entertainment, not on the level of history, right? On the level of history, I think uh, it, 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 it certainly, like, I have a lot of time for people who want to criticize it. And I think there's two, I kind of think of two broad categories of liberties. One is with the, the factual stuff, right? Like the fact that there were actually more Skylers, like the whole plot device about how Angelica is, you know, has no has no brothers and therefore has to get married is just made up um, okay. and and inaccurate. Um, so there's stuff like that where it's just like the the plot is dependent on these facts that did not did not happen. <laughs> these made up or false facts. Um, but I actually I'm I'm more, I'm more forgiving of that stuff because some of that stuff is is not it, it's not uh, particularly important to. The overall message of the musical. I think where we should be careful about reading too much into the musical is where there's more thematic liberties taken. Um, for example, the, the 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 moral and political messages of the musical are designed to be pleasing to a New York City audience more than they are designed to be accurate. Or sometimes they're un things that are uncomfortable about Hamilton's politics or would be uncomfortable to a New York City audience today uh, are just entirely removed or sanitized. A, a good example there is Hamilton's support of the Alien and Sedition Acts, this, these really anti-immigrant pieces of legislation. Um, the narrative of the musical is that immigrants, we get the job done. And you get the, you know, get the sense that Hamilton was this um, unrepentant champion 
of immigration, which wasn't true. And I think those those are the kinds of liberties that I think are a little bit more um, dangerous and, and ought to be critiqued. Well, certainly yeah, immigration. The other one, I think, is slavery. Um, you know, there's the yeah. the John Lawrence character who is anti-slavery, and you get the sense that Hamilton is too. But you know, if you look at his life and and certainly uh, William Schuyler's life, uh, you know, slavery doesn't seem to be a big issue. And and one of the issues I think with that too is for as great as it is that you know you have this diverse cast on stage and uh, the show is essentially colorblind in its in its casting, that also kind of eliminates the it eliminates the visual identification of slaves within the show. So when you go see it, there, there's no, I, I don't even know if there are slaves on the, in the cast at all, even in the ensemble playing slaves at any point, but the, there's no visual cue of these people are quote unquote free. These people are quote unquote enslaved. There's, and so that narrative almost gets removed from the whole show. There's actually one and it's used as a, a kind of dismissive, punchline in the song that you mentioned and what did i mess um thomas jefferson says sally be a lamb darling won't you open it oh yes which is a reference to a real person who gets used as kind of a yeah kind of like this this cheap joke almost mm -hmm. and i think the actress who comes on is part of the core or that's i guess more of a dance terminology but part of the ensemble it doesn't have a, a name in it that's the only time she's sort of represented and she plays probably like half a dozen characters so it's like you said it's a it's a bit of a joke sort of a, an easter egg if you know the deeper history about jefferson but it's not given the relevance that that may or the weight that i think it could be yeah because it's so central to that period of time and and they talk about the division between the Southerners and the, the Northerners, I mean, in the cabinet battle, Hamilton does make the, say a line about, you know, we really know who's doing the planting and, you know, that's why you have all this money, but it's not sort of the central point. And, you know, even debating, you know, where the capital is going to be or this, this clear division of North and South, that issue doesn't come up at all. And that's one of my biggest structural uh, or historical issues with the show is that that, that issue, that that realistic uh, factor of slavery and enslavement, um, even in terms of the fighting of the war in the first act, the use of slaves during the Revolutionary War on both sides, like that, why why does that not come up more? And and when I was sitting there in the show, you have this anti-slavery character, but you don't see slaves, and I I just really thought that. You know, as you said, Chris, that that felt like something to me, as you were saying, that's a New York City audience thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's I, I think it's it's probably one of the the biggest problems with what I was talking about before. Right. The the, the one of the most damaging liberties that's taken with the history. Yeah. Uh, damaging in terms of you getting getting a wrong impression of like, oh, yeah, these guys were a bunch of anti-slavery heroes. Um, which is kind of the impression you get uh, from from the musical, even though, as you said, um, the 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 actual existence of enslaved people is is somewhat erased. Um, it, it is complicated and nuanced by um, by then creating an entire, you know, using using the genre of rap and then having so many members of the cast be African-American, which they have you know, Debbie Diggs, who you mentioned before, has referred to, you know, playing these dead presidents and getting my reparations. Um, and I don't, you know, I, 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 I don't know how, you know, how, how deep he would want to go on that or how serious, like if he was just making a quip or if he um, feels like, you know, how, how profound he feels like that, that really is of a message. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a little bit of a message. They're, 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 they're leaning a bit on, and Miranda especially, I think, is leaning on the use of African-American music and casting to to represent black americans uh even though they are absent from the story and i think that's um i don't know if that i don't think that's a, absolves uh, the the gaps but um it, it actually is maybe one of the reasons why hamilton hasn't been as criticized for that because what you see is uh is a, a more diverse cast than you're used to um celebrating music that is african-american music um 
And that is what that's what's visually represented. And that's what a lot of the attention what, what a lot of the attention was on rather than the actual absence of black characters in the story. Yeah, and it's sort of a nice way, too, for Miranda and the cast to, to get around the fact that you're telling a political story, an 18th century American political story. And at the heart of that, the, the politics between the founding fathers, there aren't going to be African-Americans present at those things other than in a sort of service role as, as enslaved people. So having African-Americans on the stage and, and depicting these characters sort of is, it seems like a way to acknowledge the presence of African-Americans throughout American history and telling a story in which they were excluded, but bringing them in now in, in, a, in a different way than what we've seen in the past. But that leads me to a question that, that I've wondered for a long time, given all of the, the liberties that were, were taken with this and, and some of these things that are absent from the show, Tara, do you think we can describe Hamilton as a public history project? I do. I think public history project doesn't mean that it has to be accurate or politically correct, for example. I think, like, whether we think it's a, like a compare it to a museum exhibit or another form of art or even something that maybe the three of us would have written at some point in, in some form, all history has a perspective and biases and, and goals that are interwoven in it that um, that change and shift the narrative. So I think this is just one of the very many means of how we write history. And I like something I read about it a few years ago. It was in a, a Vox article by Aja Romano, who called it not public history, but called it akin to fan fiction. And I'm not sure if that's sort of a, a type of writing that you're familiar with. It usually refers to forms of pop culture in which fans go and write or do fan art and they, they change the narrative. They might, um, you know, rewrite an ending or, or, or um, explore various crossovers between different universes. And the author, she, Romana, was saying that she felt, finds in this way that Hamilton was sort of reclaiming the canon for the fans. So like if you look at the traditional American history canon and, and how the founding fathers and the founding of the country, you know, is on this pedestal, but it was a way of sort of someone from our generation reclaiming that narrative, rewriting that to make it something that's, like as you mentioned, digestible for a 21st century audience, claiming that narrative for the people. And, and she sort of was referring to this as quite a radical act itself, and that was more important than the accuracy. And I think a lot of public history often pushes the barriers in dismantling traditional narratives. So I think Hamilton would fit, even with its inaccuracies and gaps, um, it's it's imperfect like every type of history we write and and so i think it really fits in in that genre of public history sort of that's challenging pre-existing narratives how much do you think though that challenge is to uh, broadway conventions versus sort of historical convention because the show is going up against you know a traditional broadway musical what you would expect when you go in the theater i mean that, i think that would have to be part of it right and, and part of its re whatever resistance it has to traditional ideas is, is part of that is a Broadway tradition. Right. I, I think fair enough. Uh, it's, it's probably different than most of the shows or the, the historic shows, for example, that, that I've listened to throughout my life. But I do think, I mean, in some ways it's, it's comfort food because right. you're going in there and there's a level of comfort and familiarity with the Washington and Jeffersons and, and probably to the extent of Hamilton, if you don't know his story, you know him from the dollar bill. Um, the $10 bill. So there's probably a level of comfort, but the way that they show these individuals, and I should say they're showing men, uh, and maybe if we have a chance, we can talk a little bit more about the gender representation, but they're taking people who are, who are in some ways, um, they're making them more complicated than perhaps that you might've gotten in your elementary school history or even your high school history. They're, they're taking things that you're comfortable with and they're giving them nuances and edges and I, I think taking them down a notch in some cases maybe not with Washington but um, certainly with, with with Jefferson and Hamilton and Burr himself so I think you probably leave there there's probably you leave probably the theater feeling sort of proud but I think it also um, makes the people involved more human 
sort of the man behind the, the hero. And I think that would give people something a little bit more to think about. Yeah, I, I agree. And what I do like about the show is that it's treating people who at least, you know, some, I, I lived in Boston for a year and, and the founding fathers there, of course, have a the, sort of this prominent place within the, the public sphere, but like it says statues, right? And there's no subtlety to statues whatsoever, right? It's just, here's a statue, here's the guy, but here's a show now where you can see some of the edges and some of the nuance to, to people and, and you're filling them out a little bit. And, and I don't know, Chris, do you, like, do you think that the show in a way is, is humanizing people who, at least in my opinion, have been dehumanized through this idol tree of American mythology through, through the way history gets presented in public space? Yeah, and there's there's an act of there's an aspect of humanizing people that in itself is broadly accurate, even if you get the details wrong. By which I mean these were humans, right? Yeah. Um, so so even even through historical fiction, by reminding us that these were real people who were complex and lived, um, is is a valuable thing in itself. I think the way in which Hamilton does that. Actually, my, my, my sense is that it does not, uh, that, that it is more of a tribute to Broadway convention than a, than a, than a departure from it. You know, there, there's a lot of, there's clearly a lot of influence of past musicals that Miranda loves that he's incorporated into this. And I think, you know, the character, the way that the character of Burr is created, I think probably was very little like the real Burr and is much more like the, fictional Judas of Jesus Christ superstar, um, this, this sort of sympathetic, conflicted, doomed villain, almost playing this, playing this part that they have to play and they, they can't get out of it. Um, the, the thing that I, I think we shouldn't lose sight of, especially if, you know, if people haven't seen the musical or haven't read the Chernow is that I think a lot of the historical criticisms that we're making that are super valid are mostly about what's missing, right? What's missing mm -hmm. is a, a lot of the women. What's missing is a lot of the people of color um, from the actual, you know, the actual people from the, from the story and from the historical period. Uh, what is there? I think a lot of it is, is actually really historically dense. The, as someone who was new, relatively new to this story, I don't, I, I had a lot of ignorance around uh, all of the historical events in Hamilton, watched the musical first, assumed that more of it was fictionalized than it was. You know, because it's such a good story, because the storytelling is so good, there's things in this musical that I thought were made up. And then when I read the Chernow, uh, I was surprised at how often I was coming across passages that were, oh, that was that lyric was actually a direct quote. Like Hamilton really did write, I wish there was a war. Um, Angelica Schuyler really did in a letter to her sister, warn her that Hamilton was an Icarus figure. Um, so there, there are passages like that that are actually lifted uh, verbatim from from source documents. But also, even just the, a lot of the characterization of you know the strategy behind Washington and Hamilton's strategy behind winning the war, or the historical facts around how Hamilton was writing for him and and how they crafted his his farewell speech and, and what his farewell speech meant, why it was significant that they were teaching, you know, teach him how to say goodbye is an important historical uh, concept poetically put. So I do actually think that it, for what's there, for what is included, I'm, I'm impressed at the density of information um, that actually does give someone a pretty, uh, a pretty good crash course and introduction to this, this period in history uh, accounting for what we've already talked about all the things that get left out i i think that's fair and especially you know i made reference to the cabinet debates before those offer a lot of information on the the various individuals perspectives on what's going on and, and what they want to put forth what their their policies what their beliefs are and it is you're, you're right there is a lot of of that density, I think it's a great word to use in the show, uh, in terms of the historical content that, especially with political stuff, uh, you know, you mentioned, you know, Washington going, uh, doing the two term and then going away. I, another one I really like is Room Where It Happened. And this idea that the quote unquote real politics and the real work gets done outside of 
the chambers of where things are supposed to happen. And, and that's at the very least a complaint that a lot of people have had. But I think it's, it's true as well that a lot of political wrangling goes on after hours behind the scenes. And, and it's stuff that we have no access to. Uh, you know, they're not writing letters in those meetings, right? There's no one official there taking notes. And that's how they people historically have gotten things done, right? That's that's it. And that's a song that's it, it's fun because it's created out of a gap in the historical record where there, there really is not a lot of clear um, primary documentation around how those how that horse trading happened and how those uh, decisions got made because it was in this room behind closed doors. And so you can create this song out of an absence. Another another great example of that is the song Burn. Um yeah which is maybe a good opportunity for Tara to say more about what, what she wanted to say about the, um, about gender in the musical. Um, but burn is another example where it is, it is true that Eliza burned all of her letters and removed herself from the historical record. And so the only way, at least in that, in the, in, the, in that moment, one way, I shouldn't say the only way, but in that moment, one way that Miranda found to reinsert her was to fictionalize the act of herself uh, removing removing herself from that historical record in that way. Just to add on to the density, I taught a course last year called Liberty, Work, and Power, which was a second year American history course. And I'm a Canadian historian, but I'm at a very small campus. And so sometimes we get thrown into courses that um, are not necessarily our specialty. And I hadn't really done much American history since I did my comps during my PhD. And I wasn't quite, I didn't really realize how much Hamilton covered until, um, first of all, I, I discovered from the first class when I had my students fill out why they took this course. Literally half the class took it because of Hamilton. They were non-history majors. They were coming from criminology. They were coming from game, game design, and they took it because they were interested in Hamilton. And I thought, okay, well, we can bring it up during my week on the American Revolution and maybe a little bit on the founding sort of government principles. But we could talk about it for sort of five weeks because it came up time and time again from the issue sort of raised from Act 1 to Act 2. It was so dense. We were throwing out, you know, song titles and quotes. Um, I would have sort of Easter eggs in my in my lecture slides with, with sort of those references that, that sort of kept the conversation going. And I was very surprised how long, how much history is covered in it and how even, you know, post Hamilton's death, the the individuals involved and the, you know, with their how their stories continued and how it would draw back to some of their principles from the Revolutionary Age. It was that was really interesting. Do you think that if you introduce the show or elements from the show to a group of students in a classroom who had not had a previous relationship with the show, it would have been as successful as as a means to engage with them is to, and to get them interested in the content you were talking about? I was, I had planned a Hamilton assignment sort of leading up to it. I thought what if one of the assignments was they would take a song and analyze the historic context behind the song and maybe get into some things like um, the accuracy of it. Then I thought, Oh no, that's, you know, there might only be a handful of Hamilton fans. And um, you know, I, I, I didn't think it would work. And then when I realized how many students did, I thought, well, that could have flown. But there were students who we did. The one song we did look in depth was Farmer Refute at Samuel Seabury, sort of anti-independence call to action. And the lyrics go by so fast. And I handed out, handed them out that it just went over a lot of students' heads who weren't already engaged in it just because of the speed. They weren't maybe Broadway fans to begin with. So um, in some ways, I was relieved I didn't sort of force it upon everyone for, for those for those who were not already engaged just because I mean I had listened to the cast recording for years I had seen it twice by then in the theater and a lot of my students were sort of equally to, equally engaged even if they hadn't seen it um, I think perhaps in the future if there's a teaching resource that has for example a, a good non pirated sort of version that you could show clips and not just not just the audio or have have it be more part of a public history class as opposed to an American history class where you could analyze it like you're doing now as a project as opposed to mining it for specific content for for um, sort of a second year history class. But I think it presents a lot of possibilities of what could be done. Yeah, and I think the 
the movie, whenever it comes out, I don't know if what's going on now has altered the release date for that as well, but I know they, they filmed the original Broadway cast on Broadway, and the plan was to release it as a movie. Uh, I, I think once enough of the the tours went around and, and other casts uh, or other cities had their had access to the show because Miranda had talked about he, he this is a stage show and he wanted people's first time seeing it to be on stage for as many people as possible uh, but they did film it with the original cast so whenever that comes out that is, that will be an available tool to uh, historians uh, to to be able to use that um, I do want to talk uh, Terry you mentioned gender. I do want to talk about gender because I think that the most important character, the the main character, if it's not it's it's not Hamilton, uh, if it's not Burr, then it's Eliza, uh, Eliza Schuyler. And I will say one of the reasons I was disappointed slightly when I saw it is Danae Benton was there as Eliza, but she was off that day, and we got the understudy, and the understudy did a fine job, but. Throughout the whole of the first time the Schuyler sisters come on stage, I was sad because it wasn't Danae Benton. So maybe, <laughs> maybe that is part of my, my thinking about it. But, but Sarah, how do you feel about the way in which a gender is represented in the show and, and how the women are portrayed? Well, I think before I saw it, I have, was very familiar with the cast recording and the, the women's songs are so dynamic and um, both Sue and Goldsberry's voices are incredible. Like, I still don't understand how satisfied is possible. Um, that speaks to just my, my ignorance of, like, of, of being a performer. But, I mean, it, it's, just, it's just incredible. Um, and so I went to see it. I saw it in New York City. And I went with my friend Samantha Cotrera, who's another historian and um, a huge fan. And after the show, we were both sort of, like, you know, debriefing. And one of the things she said was she said, I was, I was surprised about how... Um, how the women were not on stage very often, given how important their songs seem when you listen to it. But visually, the characters are only in it marginally. You know, there's sort of two big songs or three big songs in the first act, and then they're on the fringes. And so she thought visually it was really striking for her that they didn't come across as as towering figures as they did just listening to it. And I think it's true that the the three main characters maybe suffer from the fact that they're presented for the most part as just being obsessed with Hamilton, that they're not shown to have much of a, a narrative beyond being there for him, being interested and intrigued by him or being disappointed by him. And I think that maybe suffers. And I mean, the show is Hamilton. It is his story, certainly. But it would be interesting to have had a few nods to their lives beyond him. And while I do agree, Eliza is incredibly important and I think it's telling that she has the the you know the, the the end of the last song and it's about sort of it's it's sort of she has sort of the last remarks about you know who lives who dies who tell your story but in some ways the fact that her entire life after her husband's death which went on for decades it's presented that she was focusing on and almost like just honoring his legacy gathering the evidence I wanted more for Eliza at that point right. and you know historically <laughs> I just felt that it was um to have all the women sort of be in this circle around him um, in a way that the male characters have their own, their own lives. I don't know if that was a commentary supposed to be about the limitations and sort of the restrictions that women had and, and lack of autonomy, which of course is called upon, you know, on their first appearance in, in the Schuyler sisters. But I also wondered if it was a bit of an afterthought for not giving them the same care necessarily as the more dynamic male characters. Right, yeah, she lives for 50 years after he dies, and all she does is serve him in those 50 years. Like, the, like something like the orphanage, you know, sure, like, yes, he was an orphan, and I'm sure that, that there's motivation there, but she surely did stuff in, those, in that period that was for her, and she would have derived some joy in these activities. And, yeah, to have it be presented as it's all in service of his legacy – you're right. I, it's, it kind of takes, I, I felt as though it take, took whatever agency she had throughout the show and kind of took it away a little bit that it's almost like part, like sort of, she died with him almost in a way. And to be fair, you know, often widowhood could be very narrow for women, even those who, who had privilege and money, but we don't get to see 
any action throughout the play. Like we don't get to see, for example, the women doing, I don't know, war work or discussing anything that's not Hamilton. And of course, we know realistically behind the scenes that's not what it what 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 it was. But there's not even like these couple of lines. Like even if Angelica had just been not as obsessed with Hamilton. I mean, certainly she calls him out in act two with his behavior, but the fact that both sisters are sort of falling over him was, um, I think, limiting in sort of representing women's autonomy, especially for the character of Angelica. Hmm. Uh, Chris, what do, you, what do you think about the way uh, women are represented in the show? And, and one of the things that, that I'm curious, too, is you have the Schuyler sisters. I guess the other main female character is the one who, uh, who Hamilton has an affair with. And there's a, a great, uh, I, I can't remember the name of the comedian, but it's a female comedian. She has a bit about the song, like, say no to this. And how she was sitting there thinking, as Hamilton is singing, like, give me the strength to say no to this. She's sitting there thinking, say no to what? She didn't ask you anything. Um, like, <laughs> you know, and, and sort of that, that that character is almost used as a prop in, in a sense as well. And, and I'm just curious to know what, what your reaction is when you're seeing these depictions on stage. Yeah, I don't know if I have a lot to add to what Tara said. I think she she summarized it pretty well. I, I, I but I was I was sitting here thinking of Maya Reynolds, as you say, as another example of someone who's treated pretty cheaply, um, sort of just like as a she's a villain. You know, she's just this this temptress who shows up and ruins Hamilton's life. And it wasn't Ham Hamilton's fault. He couldn't say no to it. How would I right. say no? <laughs> um, and uh, so so I think that's that's another example where the 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 depiction of women is pretty, um, pretty shallow. Another, you know, just thinking of, I don't know a lot, you know, this is, this oft, often ends up being a problem with, with history as well, more generally. Um, so even as we're discussing this, we're sort of saying, oh, we could have learned so much about Eliza's last 50 years without, without us, or I don't know if I can speak for everyone, but without being able to fill in those blanks very much because, because there's a, there's this shortcoming in history as well. Um, Angela's, Angelica is interesting uh, for she she does have uh, at least in the Chernow, uh, which is obviously what my my main source is not being a historian and having just read a little bit of history around this. Um, she does have a whole other life, which as as Tara mentioned manifests in her eventually uh, telling off Hamilton in the second act. But she, she you know she she goes and has a whole other life in a whole other country, um, including. Uh, this, this other maybe kind of relationship with Thomas Jefferson, which again is a story centered around a man, but takes her out of the Hamilton's orbit um, and maybe gives you an opportunity to give tell a story with her having uh, a little bit more of her own life and her own agency as well. Um, so yeah, like I say, I don't I don't think I have a lot to add other than I think that, that it's a really good point that um, that the the, 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 the the their shortcomings and how the women are how much stage time they get, how their stories are depicted. Um, and that when, when the ending, when Eliza gets to say, oh, 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 by the way, it was me, you know, who, who Hamilton is, almost comes, almost works as a piece of theater because of how much she's been taken for granted in the rest of the play. It's like a twist ending where, right. where you say, oh, by the way, Eliza mattered. Um, and, and, <laughs> So it works. It works as theater and as storytelling, because of uh, because of the way she's been treated for the rest of the story. Right. So let's talk about the end uh, and who lives, who dies, who tell your story. So, so spoiler alert: if you haven't seen it, Hamilton dies. Uh, he gets shot, and uh, then the the final song is Eliza. Uh, What's well, all the all the other characters basically saying, doing a tribute to Hamilton, and then the final words are to Eliza and what she did after Hamilton died, which included, I mentioned the orphanage that was open and, and basically just trying to tell people's story. Uh, she was involved in the Washington Monument and other memorials to uh, to the, the founding fathers. I hate this song so much. Um, not as a song. It's a fine song. I hate the messaging of the song. I hate the, the content of of the song. I remember being in the theater and being bored by it and knowing that it was the last song and just being like, so the, the message of who lives, who dies, who tells your story. It, it's so reductive to me that it has no meaning. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's what history is. And 
I, I think it's intended to have some sort of emotional resonance and be some sort of aha moment. And maybe I'm just not the audience member to have that. But for me, it was just like, yeah, okay. Like, so what? Like, there was no there there for me. And that was my reaction to the end of the show. And even now when I listen to the soundtrack, when it gets to Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story, I'm, I'm okay if I, like, get disrupted at that point and I have to, like, walk away. Uh, so that, that, like, really most of my complaints about the show can be boiled into this song. But that's my reaction to it. So I'm curious to know what both of your thoughts are on that, uh, on that song. Chris, let's start with you. <laughs> You monster. <laughs> you heartless. Uh, I, I mean, I just, I just criticized the song, you know, on one level, I guess I'm, I guess I'm experiencing this, this, I experienced the play and just like as a piece of theater entertainment in a totally different way than as a, as a piece of theater or sorry, excuse me, as a piece of uh, history or, you know, as an, as an academic uh, artifact or something. I, I am maybe one of the reasons that I think I love musical theater so much is because I allow myself to is because I'm just extremely willing to get swept up in the emotion of it and uh, and just get carried along with it. Uh, and also, usually by the last song, I have had a cocktail or two. So I'm a little bit more emotional. <laughs> uh, I'm just like I'm just. I'm just willing uh, and there and ready. So I, um, I thought it was, I, no, I just, I just, I thought it was, you're right. It's, it's simplistic, but I, I, you know, I, it worked for me as a piece of, as a piece of poetry. Um, and as you know, the full message being, you have, you have no control over who lives or who dies or who tells your story that, you know, people have come and gone throughout the story and people come and go throughout our, lives and and how will we be remembered but this is you know it on the emotional level it's the story of 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 redeeming um you know the the, the narrative around how hamilton deserved deserved better than than just being the guy on the ten dollar bill that that he deserves to be remembered and i think that that um you know whether or not you believe that of hamilton we all want to believe that of each other there's another um a year or two after hamilton the the big tony award-winning musical was um uh dear evan hansen which has uh an, also has a massive hit about how no one deserves to be forgotten mm -hmm. and it's just the same it's just the same simple human emotional message i don't think at that point it's supposed to be on the level of theater and entertainment it's not necessarily supposed to be about those people it's supposed to be about that that idea that um, isn't isn't it a, a beautiful thing when someone remembers you and tells your story? Uh, that's a very different take from me. So, uh, Tara, <laughs> can, Tara, can you break the tie? Well, I'm going to have to side with Chris. I think <laughs> by that point in the story, I've already been walloped twice with with Philip's death and then Hamilton's death, and I'm crying. And it's so beautiful. I think it's a beautiful song in terms of lyrically. And I, you know, as much as I as I just said, I felt bad for Eliza. Her voice is so beautiful at the end. And like lyrics, like every other founding father gets to grow old. It's just like, oh, yes, it's so true that I'm just swept up by the emotions at that point. I mean, I guess to step back a bit and like put on my, my, hat, I guess it's a different variation on, you know, the idea that history is written by the victors and those who live longer tend to be able to want to control the narrative. And there's, I think for people who don't, who, who don't think about the way that history is written, the idea, it, it doesn't offer someone to think about that history is a construct and the people who tell the stories and how the story of even Hamilton has been rewritten over the years, Miranda being the latest person to present his story. Um, I, I think it does offer a bit of sort of his window into historiography or the idea that history is not a science in the same way that it's, you know, if you throw the same facts into a bowl, you're not going to always get the same story. And so I, I like that it sort of reminds people that history is a story and what gets included in that story, who's telling it, what are the goals of that story is, is not something that's static. I guess one of the other issues, though, I have, and, and both of you, it's fair. Like, I know that I am in the vast, vast minority of this. And I understand, like, the show is trying to make this an emotional appeal to the audience. 
Um, but but one of the things that that I sort of cur- find curious about it is, you know, the last song is that's what the audience is going to take with them when they leave. Like that's the last thing they see. That's sort of what's going to be coursing through their veins as they walk out. And, and I realize that for most musicals, the last song is happy and fun and you know everything has been resolved and everything's great and th- there can be a message to it like a show like kinky boots where there's a clear message of be nice to each other and and you know that's sort of the overarching theme of that show but it's always these big show toony you know the whole cast is on stage singing and dancing and everything is great so it's very different from what a traditional final song is but for me for for sean the historian i i don't like the the closing message be pay attention to how, who tells the story like that that just for me it just didn't sit right like i wanted to wh- whether it's something about eliza or, or angelica who's mentioned in that song too for helping with all this stuff after hamilton dies or even if it's something about hamilton the place of the founding fathers in contemporary life just like something that that wasn't so I, i'll use the word reductive again that just like, I don't think the, the message in that song is the core of what the show is about. And I guess I just felt a disconnect there for me. Um, but, you know, I'm happy to, to be wrong. I'm happy to be wrong in that, uh, or, or at least have the two of you disagree. <laughs> I'd like to hear, what was your, what's your closing number? What, what, uh, what do you think was the big message of the show that you wanted to hear a, a show tune about? So I, I think the show is about uh, the institutions of American governance. I think that's what the core of the show is, that at its core, the, the people who have created this system that, that, we have to entr- that we have to entrust that what has been created, even with all the flaws in it, that there's value in that. Uh, that that's what I think this show is about, is, is giving legitimacy to the people and the institutions. It's not as catchy. <laughs> it really it really is. i honestly i would have been i would have been good if the show ended at burn to be honest right if if that's the end of the song and eliza this this big moment for her of agency and and within the show is sort of taking her life back i would have been okay with with that i know you can't because philip is still alive at that point and you have to have that red that that you know the the song that I find the most emotional is "It's Quiet Uptown," right? And yeah, hell, I would have been good if I mean it's, it's not a great way to end the show, but like you could end the show there too, <laughs> um, or or if it ends when he's dead, like he gets shot and he's dead, and that's the end. and then you don't have a big closing number, right? I, I've I saw a couple like Tootsie didn't have a big closing number. The curtain just dropped and it's like, oh okay, the show's over now. Like like I don't know, it just. I, I think there's other more emotional and more relevant moments in the show that in the second act that we could, you know, turn to go, you know, fade to black. on. It, it, it's interesting. Like I, I kind of, I, it was interesting to hear Tara. Like I, I didn't, I didn't know if I was qualified to make this statement, but I think I, th- Tara, I think I heard you saying that, you know, the concept of who tells your story is a, is a pretty important one um, for historians to pay attention to. And it, it's it's almost what I think is interesting about you know ending by criticizing this song is that it's almost addressing all of our other criticisms of the musical. It, it says you know like hey if if the message is like let's pay attention to who is telling these stories and how they get told and retold, then this story too has been flawed, and the way that this story has been told has been flawed. Uh, so it it almost is is kind of self aware in that way and self-aware in a way that uh, points to the kinds of criticisms that we and others have been making or it's just a catchy song and I like it. No, I, I think that's fair. That, that, that I've never thought about that sort of full circle way that there's flaws in the story and then, yeah, there's flaws in the way we tell all stories. That's an interesting, that, that's an interesting way to look at it. I've made, that makes me feel better about the song and <laughs> uh, ending that way. Uh, now I've, I've, I've kept you longer than I said I would, but if you'll indulge me, I want to talk about one other thing uh, that I think is really important to this. Uh, and it's important to all culture, I think, that, that becomes really ingrained uh, within the popular psyche of, uh, of a country or, or culture. And that is timing uh, of this show. And I can't help but think that 
the timing of when this show came out, you know, in within the midst of the Obama administration, that you know, across the country, especially in New York, there is this great optimism uh, with it with the federal government, with, you know, trusting in the people who are in the federal government. Whereas if this show comes out now in 2020, that I don't know if it's as big of a hit as it, as it is just because of the relationship people, especially, you know, liberal New Yorkers who are the ones who tend to go to these shows have with the federal government right now. And I, I legitimately wonder if this show could work in, 2020 America it, as a new show. It, it can work as an established show, sure, but as a new show, I'm not so sure it, it could work. But uh, Tara, what do you think about that? Well, I think a lot of the show and the message it has about the importance of public service and serving your country and sacrificing for your country reminded me a lot of the television show The West Wing, which had a really optimistic view of people working their hardest and their best intentions, even when they're flawed, about doing what they could for their love of America and their love of of their president, who uh, President Bartlett being this very idealized, thoughtful, critical thinker um, type of president. The show reminded me a lot of of that, the idea that the government could work, that the people, it, it, the government was only good as the people who worked there, whether you were elected or you were a civil servant. And so I saw a lot of parallel in that. And I think now we're leaving in like a Veep era, to borrow another television show that looks at um, the corruption of politics and sort of everyone's worst instincts and the selfishness and the greed. And so I think it would be a different note if it did come out now. I mean, certainly you could admire the songs, you could admire the choreography and the creativity, but I think you're right that the, the, the optimism of the Obama era that got reflected in, I think, both Miranda as a creator, and I think he, he previewed the show at the White House in its very early stages and, and sort of got the Obama seal of approval. And and I just think of it as uh, stories of when, for example, Pence went to see the show and like the cast literally booed him yeah. in the um, curtain call, that I think if the momentum wasn't there built in advance, that it just, the mood wouldn't be there to, the appetite wouldn't be there or it would be wouldn't be seen as 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 sort of a genuine message of hope. It would be maybe seen as a bit more old fashioned view of of America. Yeah, I think it's even sorry. Go ahead, stronger Chris, yeah. than the way you put it. I think it's even stronger than the way you put it, Sean. It's not just that the show wouldn't work as well uh, today. I don't think it would exist because, as Tara pointed out, like I, I that the it had some very literal connections to the Obama White House in terms of its creation and its gestation. Uh, but it was also very much a product of the broader cultural moment. And that is important to note because it is another pretty good criticism of Hamilton. Uh, and the parallel with West Wing, I think, is, is, is really uh, appropriate as well, that it is not just optimistic, but almost naively optimistic mm -hmm. in a way that maybe helped create the current moment. There, there is, I don't know if I personally, or how much I, how strongly I believe this or not, but there's certainly a strong line of criticism that this kind of naive optimism that this is the America we are now and we're not going back, um, that everyone in government is, is well-intentioned and good, uh, blinded us to um, some real cynical stuff that was brewing and uh, and, and helped to create, helped to actually uh, create that moment. And people look back on, especially people who don't like Hamilton and don't like Lynn manuel Miranda will look back on a moment at a Hillary Clinton fundraiser when he was on stage uh, rhyming Tim Kaine in the membrane, which just seems so stupid now. Uh, it was like a, a silly, silly rhyme at the time, but now is almost like you guys were just like, joking and laughing and having fun and and rhyming while you were you were losing the election and you didn't even know it and so it gets it gets wrapped up in that too that sort of um if if you want to criticize if you want to criticize liberals and democrats for how they uh for what happened in 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 2016 part of that criticism is you guys all thought 
that you were in the West Wing. You guys all thought that you were in Hamilton, and that's not the way the world works, and that's part of why you lost. I think, too, one of the things that goes along with that is, you know, if whatever happens this fall, right, but if it, say say whoever, say the, the Democrats win uh, and Trump leaves, you know, with the peaceful transfer of power that has happened forever, if all that sort of, if that were to happen, I think the show almost gets stronger in it's saying that, like, these institutions that are here, as, as you were talking about, Chris, that they work and the, the people who are in them will abide by them. And what has what happened at that moment has created this strong country. And, and one of the strengths of the show, I think, as a result, and, and one of the things that I think will allow it to just continue forever is the relationship that people have to the show will forever or will always be linked to whatever their relationship is with government. And that is a constantly changing relationship based on your personal views and who is in power at the time. So that evolution, I think, will allow the show to have multiple lives and people to have different relationships with it over time. Like, I, I, I legitimately wonder if this is a show that will ever have a chance to be revived because I don't know if it'll ever go away off Broadway. Um, you know, if it's sort of a, a situation where it's like phantom, where it's just going to be there forever. And, and I, I think it's because you can go see it over and over again. One, because the songs are really good, but two, because, you know, the way you interpret it, the way you understand it is constantly going to be, be changing and evolving uh, as you are as a human being. I realize I didn't ask a question there, but uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, so, so Tara, just sort of to wrap up, what over overall, you know, I, I started by saying how would you describe the show, uh, but what would, what are your main takeaways from the show and uh, the things that that you think have made it the, hit, the the big hit that it is, and what has given it the cultural relevance that it has? Well, first, I think. I, I've been very struck by Miranda's personality as a public figure, aside from his creative genius. Like I think he is, he's maybe in particularly the post-Trump era, tried to inject this stream of positivity that has been inspiring people either through his, his Twitter feed or his other types of um, enga public engagement. He's, he's, he's sort of this, this sort of public bubble of joy that tries to infuse sort of positivity and kindness and and inspiring other young artists to to have opportunities to to create as well so i think i will always remember him from this in, in independent of his his work sort of as as the creator and as the performer is just what he represented in this year and, and and how meaningful he has been to to so many people myself included and then i would look at him in his role as the creator because i'm still just astounded by the lyrics by by the the score by everything about it it's just a it's such a creative inspiring act to see to take something that you would think like you could make a musical about that or you and to and have it really be resonating and connecting with so many people and i think it also i would think of this as a moment about just musicals in general they've had i think a bit of a revival in the last maybe two decades. I know growing up, I was always really sort of a, a fan of show tunes and, you know, I'd have my Walkman and I'd have, I don't know, the King and I playing on it while all my friends were listening to much more popular music. And I always was like, I never told anyone that that's what I was listening to. And I feel with Hamilton and a lot of other shows, both in film as well as on Broadway and off Broadway have really brought back the genre and made it more acceptable, more popular and I still don't know why. Like, it's hard to dissect the musical as a form, whether it's being swept away by something that on paper looks so silly, like people singing about their lives. And um, so I, I will remember it as this moment of sort of musicals becoming mainstream and being able to chat more openly with uh, something I've been passionate about for a long time. And, and it's just sort of in sort of that public that's public spotlight and giving attention to to new shows that have come since hamilton uh, and chris what about you yeah i agree i think i think that if i had to choose a 
a legacy for it that I thought was going to be more more long lasting or more significant between a legacy of being a piece of either public history or uh, like historical fan fiction uh, or a, a piece of, of Broadway history. Uh, I would, I would choose the latter. I think that, you know, I love, I love Broadway musicals. Um, and I love the, I love the art form. I love the genre. And this uh, Hamilton was a moment where new people became interested in Broadway and then continued to be interested in Broadway. It's a, it's a tentpole event for, for Broadway as a whole. And similar to, you know, probably Rent is the best comparison in terms of the popularity of the musical and the way that it reaches new audiences. And uh, I expect that without, without what you, what you get with Hamilton is a lot of younger people thinking, Oh, not only do I love Broadway, but maybe I want to write or perform or be involved with Broadway one day um, in the same way that uh, other great pieces of art can inspire people to create art themselves. So I, I would suspect that that's actually going to be its biggest contribution. Yeah, I, I agree and, and with both of you. And, you know, one of the things that I've noticed in the years since Hamilton's come out, that Broadway has become way more diverse. Uh, not just in terms of the people on the stage, but there, which there is a lot more diversity, but in the stories that producers are willing to fund, I think, you know, a show like Fun Home, I, I don't know if that is, could get made in the 90s or early aughts, but, you know, now stuff like that is starting to come out more and more, and uh, I, I think it's great for the, the medium. It's just a, a lot of fun, and it's hard-pressed hard to say this is like a golden age of musicals, but there's a lot of good stuff out there uh, to go listen to and to go find. So uh, it's just, uh, as someone myself as well, as you said at the start, like I just love listening to the soundtracks and going to the shows. Like I've never been to a musical that I actively disliked. Like I've never sat there. Even <laughs> even Cats, which I wasn't crazy about, uh, I was just confused the whole time. But I was like, wow, this the dancing's kind of fun. Like, yeah, right? And so that's sort of who I am. Uh, just I love it, and I love that I think this show has been – has opened new people into it, brought new people, and, and has really challenged convention and, and opened the way for different forms of storytelling and different stories to be told. And uh, that's what I – I'm really excited to see what comes next in the evolution of, of musical theater. So uh, with that – That'll be our discussion of Hamilton. I've very, this was a lot of fun for me. I've really enjoyed this. Uh, I've enjoyed it so much that I took an extra half hour of both of your time. So uh, my apologies on that. But Tara Brookfield, uh, Associate Professor in the Department of History Univer at uh, Laurier University in uh, Brantford, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, in Brantford. Uh, and new podcast? Uh, what, what's the name of the podcast? Oh, yes. I'm, I'm sort of a behind the scenes on a new podcast called One Market, which was started by my colleague, uh, uh, professor in journalism, Bruce Galepsi. He thought it would be a good idea to try and keep our camp, our very small campus connected while we're all working or studying from home. So each week we're going to feature an interview with a staff member, a faculty member and a student to see how their life has changed in this last sort of month uh, of chaos, but also just to talk about other things, what are their interests or their expertise as a way to, to keep us all connected. So that's one market and you can find it on iTunes, Spotify, Google books, or excuse me, Google podcasts. And uh, yeah, it might be a bit more like sort of inside to the Brantford campus of Wilfrid Laurier in particular, but I think the people are interesting and so others might be interested. Yeah. And I think another thing too, I, I did my undergrad at a small campus up at Nipissing and you know, having been on small campus versus large campus, like there is a different culture to small a small campus. So, you know, if you're a U of T person or U of Ottawa person or UBC, any of these really large campuses and haven't spent a lot of time on a on a small campus, I think it's worthwhile to listen to this just to get a sense of how different the life on a small campus can be versus a big campus. So I'm excited to take a listen to some of these episodes. And uh, Chris, where can people find you? Well, I, they, can, they can read my history blog at acresofsnow.ca. I, I've, I haven't been able to update it in a while, but you know what? It's history. So the stuff that I wrote there <laughs> is still, it's still readable. There. It's still there. And, uh, and I'm on Twitter at, at Chris Tyndall. Yeah. How did you get that? No one ever gets just their name. Uh, I guess I, I was an early adopter. I work in technology now, so... 
you know, I have to sign up for new accounts on all the new things. Fair enough. And there's there's a few other. There's a Chris Tindall who works in the United States Navy. There's a Chris Tindall in Australia. So there's other Chris Tindalls, but they just they're not as quick on signing up for new accounts, I guess. <laughs> well, there you go. So uh, so both check out both Chris and Tara online. And uh, thank you both so much for doing this. Uh, this has been a lot of fun for me. Thanks, everybody, for listening. As always, please do subscribe to the show wherever it is you get your podcast. Give us the likes and the ratings, all that. Helps other people find the show, keeps the show going. You can find me on Twitter at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And as always, you can email the show, HistorySlam at gmail.com. So we'll be back with you again next week. But until then, if you're out, well, don't go out. But if you're out... Stay six feet away from Enrico Palazzo and say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.